This morning, I love this. I love the Easter story. I love the resurrection story, and I know I, I typically do series, but this this morning, I'm, it's not a series. It's uh, I went a couple weeks ago, knowing that I didn't had I wasn't going to preach last Sunday because Dwayne and Renee, the presidents of Heaven's Gates and Hills Flames, was here, and they decided to stay the week with us because they had nowhere to go. Amen. <laughs> So I begin to look at the Easter story, and I like to come up with cool, catchy titles and phrases, but I don't know how you can change the Easter message. I don't know how creative you've got to be. So the title for this morning's message is real simple, The Message of Easter. And wow, what a message it is. If you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 7. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your amazing presence and your love and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in this place this morning. Thank you for the dedication of a precious baby. Father, I ask you right now to impart, to de- to, to impart your word deep into our hearts and our spirits. And God, I pray that you will help, will help us to guard the deposit that you deposit into us today. Lord, I pray that your word would be life and your word would speak to us, minister to us, change us, convict us, and get us to the place that you're calling us to this day. Lord, I ask that you would help us not to be only hearers of this word, but we would be doers of the word today as well. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every holiday has a message. July 4th, for the United States, is a holiday, but the message from that is Independence Day. That's the the day that we celebrate our dependence. Amen? Then we have the message of, of Memorial Day. That is the death of patriotic men and women who died from their country, for their country. We have the message of Mother's Day, in which we celebrate all of the moms who brought us into this world and who oftentimes tell us they can take us out. (laughs) Then we have the celebration of Father's Day, and we celebrate all of the dads and all the great things that dads do and model for us and teach us. And then we have the message of Christmas and thanks Christmas and we go around talking about the birth of Jesus and that Jesus is the reason for the season. And we have Thanksgiving and we cook a big fat turkey and we're thankful for uh, all the great blessings and things that God has provided for us. Then we have the message of Good Friday, which is the death of Jesus Christ for our sins. And then, but this morning we have the message of Easter, and what is that message? How many of you are thankful that Jesus died for your sins? Amen. Amen. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 real quick with me. For our sake, whose sake? For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Good Friday, Jesus took your place. You deserve to die. You deserve to rot. You deserved it. Every one of us deserve it. But Jesus took our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And what about this holiday? What about Resurrection Sunday? We were at the golf course this week and... um, we were getting ready to pay, and I, I don't know if that young lady is here this morning, but I asked her, I said, young lady, are you, are you ready for Resurrection Sunday? And she didn't, she didn't respond. And so I asked her again, young lady, are you ready for Resurrection Sunday? And this was her question to me, sir, what is Resurrection I said, well, it's the Easter holiday. Oh, yeah. I said, sweet, honey, do you go to church anywhere? No, I don't. We quit going to church because my family was tired of going to boring and fake churches. 
Come on. Amen. So I'm like, if you come to our church, you tell me it's fake and boring after service. We got something to change. Right? There is nothing boring about Jesus Christ. There's nothing boring about redemption. There's nothing boring. What is the message of Easter? Easter? To answer that question, we've got to look at our text again. Go back to Matthew 28, 5 through 7. Put that back up on the screen, please. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. There are four words in this text that when I read it this last, this last week, they just kind of popped off the page. And those are the four words I want to focus on this morning. Those four words are imperative. And those four words are the message that I believe, the message of Easter, and they are commands. The first word that I see that pops up off this page for me is the word come. Come. Let me just give you a little bit of background here. Jesus was dead. Hello. They've come to a, a grave. Jesus was dead. He had been betrayed by Judas, forsaken by his disciples. He had been denied by Peter, tried by the Sanhedrin, condemned to die by Pontius Pilate, crucified at Calvary, buried in a tomb of Joseph and Arimathea. On Easter morning, women came to the tomb, concerned that they would not be able to get in. Look at Mark 16, verse 3. Mark 16, verse 3. We don't have it. Okay, you're going to make me work. Go there. Mark 16, verse 3. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They were afraid they wouldn't be able to get in. When, what happened when they got there? It was already rolled away. That's a pretty powerful miracle right there in itself. When they arrived, they were in for the surprise of their lives. A great earthquake had taken place. What would you and I do this morning if this whole foundation of this church just began to shake? In California, they have great earthquakes. And here in, the, here in Louisiana, sometimes we have them and I feel them sometimes. But that day, a great earthquake had happened. They show up and great, uh, to their surprise, the, tomb, the big stone was gone. It was rolled away. Matthew 28, 2, the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and he rolled back the stone. Matthew 28, 2 through 4, when the women arrived, they were told not to fear. The angel knew that they were seeking Jesus. The angels told the, woman, the women an awesome, awesome word, and that word was come. How many of you have ever raised children? It's a full-time job. How many of you have ever said to your kids, come here, come see, right? And how many of you have had your kids say, why? Isn't it also, isn't it funny how you never have to teach your kids how to say why? Well, I've never given my boys a class on how to say why to me. It just automatically comes out of their mouth. Why? And so the angel says to these women, come, come see, come. The angel said that this was, a, this was an invitation. The word come is an invitation that's given in Scripture many, many times. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against a righteous and holy God, God has had his arms extended wide open, saying to all of us, Come, is that not the message of Jesus Christ? Is that not the message of the kingdom? Come, amen? When, when, so when people ask you to come to church, they're not asking you to come to something boring and something religious. Amen. They're asking you to come and experience and encounter the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When our worship team gets up on the stage on Sunday mornings, they're not asking you just to go through the motions. They're not asking you just to sing words because they're on a screen. They're asking you to come and engage in the presence of God. Friends, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not going to really know how to worship Jesus. It's quiet. Two people agreed with that one. Out of our relationship with Jesus flows our worship for God. I attended T.D. Jakes' church. Uh, Jeremiah was only like maybe a year old. And we were down visiting some family. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm the only white guy in the pew. 
And this black lady standing next to me, we're in the middle of worship, and she said, you're not from around here, are you? I said, no, ma'am. I told I was pastoring in South Dakota. And she said, you know what? She said, white people, when they worship, they think about it too much. I said, yeah, you got a point. And then she said, but us black people, we don't think about it enough, and we just go crazy. And we're standing there, she gives me a big hug, and she said, that's why we need each other in the same pew. Amen. And that's true. I mean, we get excited about the LSU Tigers when they're doing this or that. We get excited about the Saints, and they don't have much to get excited about. Can we get excited about Jesus? Amen. Amen. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. When we come through those doors, we're not coming to empty rituals. We're coming to worship. Amen. God gave this command. He gave this invitation to come ever since the Garden of Eden. He gave the promise of the Messiah who would have victory over Satan. Look at Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This, he used the ark built by Noah as a picture of coming to him for the protection of salvation. He invited the children of Israel to come out of Egypt. Later, he invited them to come into the promised land. He gives great invitations to come. Look at Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Come. Come. What's the next word? That means all of us, right? I don't know if you've got a different dictionary. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come. Anybody broke? Praise God. Come, he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. That's an invitation. He's saying, come. He said, come, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. All you who are thirsty, all you who are heavy laden, come, come, come. That's what he's saying. It's an invitation for us to come. Look at Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Friends, do you hear the invitation this morning? He's saying, come. Come. Come to an altar, come a little bit deeper, come a little closer, because guess what? All of you, all those people that got saved this week in heaven's gates and hell's flames, the invitation now is to come a little bit deeper, to come a little bit further. All of us that have been saved 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, it's still the same invitation. Come a little bit further. Come a little bit deeper. Paul said, I've not yet arrived. I can't be satisfied with where I'm at. I've got to keep coming. I've got to keep coming. I've shared with my son. I've shared with people when they come to me for getting married. The word become. People think that once, just because they turn 18, they automatically have become an adult. I'm 43 years old, and I'm still not becoming an adult. That becoming is an ongoing thing. And so when people come to me and they want to get married, just because you stand before God at an altar and you say, uh, do you take this woman to be your husband, Do you take our wife, do you take this wife to be your, your, your bride? I do. Just because you say do does not mean you have become one. You've made a covenant. And now that word become is an ongoing word. I am becoming one. I am becoming one. Because if automatically that day you became one, there'd be no fights. Amen. I don't know about you, but this will be 21 years in June. We don't fight, but we sometimes disagree loudly. Come on. And how many of you, when you turned 18, automatically became all-knowing? Isn't it funny that when you hit 25, your dad really knew what he was talking about? Become. 
And so God is, Jesus has given us this, this invitation, come further, come deeper. Jesus made that same, great, that same great invitation in Matthew 11. Look at verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, Sunday mornings is not the time to stay home and rest in the bed. Amen. Jesus said, come to me, not go to bedside assembly and listen to Sister Sheets sing and Brother Pillow preach. When we come to God, when we come to Jesus, and we fully surrendered, sur surrendered, we can live a guiltless life. Have you been living under a load of guilt? Have you been burdened with the awfulness of your sin? Are you confused about whether you'll go to heaven or go to hell? Oh, it, it was amazing to me as we're reading the response this week of people that had filled out the decision cards. Many of them that accepted Christ said they'd been in church for years and had never heard an invitation to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Come on. Amen. That's sad. Amen. Have, have you been heavy laden? Have you, are you here this morning and you struggle even trying to keep, keep the Ten Commandments? We, we live a life, and many of us struggle with guilt every single day. We wrestle with this sin, and that sin so easily has entangled us, and we're wrestling with all of this. I was working in a greenhouse in Joplin, Missouri, with this lady from Italy. She was a very, very strong, strong Roman Catholic. She, her and I, would begin pulling out, t picking tomatoes. We'd get this green junk all over us. And every day we build a relationship. She was about in her late 60s and I was like 19, 18, 19 years, 17, 18 years old. And one day she said to me, she said, Jack, do you follow the Ten Commandments? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. And I told her, I said, the only way that I can follow the Ten Commandments is because of the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And she said, well, I just, I don't, she said, I don't, I don't believe that you have to have a relationship with Jesus. I just believe that if, as long as I follow the Ten Commandments, I'll make it to heaven. Every single day, her and I would go back and forth. I'm 17. She's in her late 60s. I'm trying hard not to disrespect my elders. But at 17, I knew enough about God that I knew that it took more than just following the Ten Commandments. I had to make a decision to come. To come to an altar. To come and bow before my God. To come and confess that Jesus Christ was my Lord. I, I didn't win her over. At 17, I didn't know enough to, but I just, I didn't condemn her. I didn't rebuke her. She didn't condemn me and I, she didn't rebuke me. She simply just said to me, and this is the first time I ever heard this comment. Young man, let's just agree to disagree. Come on, one day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah, I get upset when people are starting to rip the Ten Commandments off the walls and buildings and stuff like that. We need the Ten Commandments. We need to live by the Ten Commandments. I like Jeff Foxworthy. I think the Ten Commandments is, here's your sign. Are you confused? This Easter Sunday, this resurrection morning, there's good news for you and I. All we have to do is simply hear the words of Jesus. Come. Come. Number two. Why come? Why? Why come? Here, here you go, teenagers. Why? Here we go. I'm going to answer it for you, okay? And Jesus isn't sitting here like I do to my kids sometimes because I said so. It's an invitation. How many of you have a senior that's going to graduate from high school this year? I do. We're sending out invitations, inviting them to come. Why are they coming? To honor 18 years of life, to honor years of going through school and giving teachers a heart attack and a headache, they're coming for that reason. It's an invitation. Jesus is saying, here, come. Why do we come? It's an invitation. Do you know that we come to him who is no longer in the tomb? You know there's, over, there's close to 9,000 false gods in the world? Just in India alone, there's like over 3,000 or whatever it is. 
any God other than the Lord himself is a false God. Friends, we have created other gods in our own lives. In fact, whatever is standing between you and God has become an idol. It's getting quiet. False gods. Some of these divinities, all these false gods, some of them took on the forms of images. Others were mythical. We come to him, we come to him this morning that is risen from the dead. I don't understand this God, this God I'm about to mention. I, I understand the devotion, I understand the religion of it. But Allah, Allah is a moon God. Islam teaches that Allah is the same God worshipped by the members of other Abrahamic religions, such as Christianity and Judaism. But yet Islamic commentators have refuted that idea as insulting. There is no proof of Allah's birth or Allah's death. There is no proof of Allah's existence. Then you have another God that many worship today called Buddha. Buddha only lived for 80 years and then he died. He's no deity. He's still in the grave. His dirty, rotten bones are still there. You go, around, go into most, a lot of places today, you see big statues of Buddha just sitting there. People go and pay homage to Buddha every, all, over this, all over the world. Buddha can't do anything for us. Amen. Then you have, and I just, looked, I just pulled out three common ones to us. Then you have this other God that really makes no sense to me. His name is Krishna. He was the God of compassion, tender love. You know how he died? This dude sitting up under a tree, twinkling his toes in the grass, and a deer hunter by the name of uh, Ahmad comes by, and he sees the grass moving, sees twinkle toes. Yeah, you serve, you, you're you worshiping Krishna, twinkle toes? That's a great God, huh? And so here he is, and here's this deer hunter. What's that moving over there? Oh, that's a deer. Pew. Krishna gets taken out by an arrow intended for a, a deer. Why do we have people serving these false gods? I was in South Dakota in the Black Hills, Mount Rushmore, and I met this Indian chief. He had written a book on Indian religion. And he and I stood there and got into a long, long debate. He started to talk to me about this sun god and this rain god. And he started to talk to me about all their practices. And I didn't have a book. All I had was the word that was in me. His word have I hidden in my heart, right? That I won't sin against him. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Be instant in season and out of season. Be ready at all times, right? And so I'm standing here with this Indian chief debating Indian religion. I'm only 25 years old at the time. I don't know much about the Lord. I know more today than I knew then. And I don't know near as what I need to know. But I'm standing here having this debate with this Indian, Indian guy. And I even told him, listen, I'm part Cherokee. I have Cherokee Indian in me. That really strum up a conversation. He was Lakota Sioux. And again, he's, he's so in love with his false religion. But I'm throwing, I'm, I'm shooting holes in all of it. Because his religion only, it stops at death. The, the God we serve, though we die, yet shall we live. Amen? That, the, the, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, now dwells within you and I. Dead gods tell no story. I like what Gandhi said. I would serve the God of the Christians if I could actually find a real Christian. Wow. Friends, dead gods tell no story. False gods offer no hope. We come to him who is living right now in heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I. John 3.16 is the one that all of us know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We come to him who offers peace and power to all who have believed in him. Look at John 14.27. Nope. We don't have it. Okay, you're making me work harder today. I'm going to charge you extra, Jason. Just kidding. Go to John 14, verse 27. P 
Peace I leave with you, and peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jump over to John 15, 1 through 7. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Come on. Have you ever wondered why you're not receiving what you're asking for? If you're not receiving what you're asking God for, you might want to check your abiding. Abide in me. Abide in Him, and He will abide in you. We, we come to God with all our requests. Friends, He will give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. He will meet every need that we have. And so a lot of times we're coming to Him, and we're having this request and that request, but we're not really abiding in Him. If we're truly abiding in Him, check the fruit. Amen. We say we're nobody's judge, but we are fruit inspectors. Number three. Next word we see is, is the word see. And this deep? Come. Why come? Now see. S coming to see requires movement. Amen. You tell your kids, come and see, and they sit there? Well, don't make me get that belt. Come and see requires movement. I want you to take something this morning. I want to break down the difference between look and see. How many of you know that you can look, and sub, look at something and never see it? How many of you have ever looked at the Bible and didn't see anything, and then you asked God for revelation, and you started to see through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, and then, boom, you saw something, and you've looked at it for years? When I look at something, I may not grasp what I'm looking at. I may not fully comprehend or understand it when I'm just looking at it. But when I truly see something and I grasp it and I comprehend it and I understand it, then I can get it. I believe that what the angel is saying to these women, he is saying, come, see, comprehend, grasp that Jesus is no longer here. Any fool could look in the tomb and see that he was gone. That's not the message that the angel was trying to portray to these women. I don't want you just to look and think, okay, somebody stole his body. Come see that what he said has now come to pass. He is no longer here. He is risen. <clears throat> I can see clearly now the rain is gone, right? You know the old song. Some of us, when it, some of us, we we're trying so hard to be good Christians, but we're not seeing the reality of what God is doing in us or through us because we've got to get the stuff out of our eyes. Amen? Come on. You, you, uh, how many of you go to Walmart and actually see broken people walking in front of you? Or do you go to Walmart and just look at people passing you by? I remember the vision that God gave jo uh, Justice a few weeks ago about seeing broken people walk down the street. Broken, hurting people walking down the street. If you're looking, you're not going to see it. But if you look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, you will see what God sees in this region. Amen? When I pray for people at the altar, I don't want to look through the eyes of Jack Osteen. I want, I want people to understand that when they come and they come to receive prayer from me, I, one, I've spent time on my face before God. Two, I've asked God to close my fleshly eyes and I've asked God to help me to start seeing through his lenses. And so whenever you start to receive something and you say, Pastor, how did you know that? Pastor, how did you see that? It's not Jack Osteen that's seeing it. It's God who's using, my, using me to see it through me and then talk to you and help you with it. Amen? 
God, open our eyes. Amen? Give me the eyes that can see. Come see. I see in seeing that God wants us to place our faith and trust in Him as our Lord and our Savior. Look at Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So we have to see this. See that today is the day of salvation. See that the day of redemption draweth nigh. See that now is the time. Amen. Now is the time. Look at, and then the, I want to go on to the next word in, that, in, the, in our scripture, and that's number four, that I want, point number four, the word go. He said, come. Why do you come? He says, I want you to see. And then the next word he says to them is now go. Go. The women were told to go. They weren't told to sit there and camp out. They weren't told to sit there and, and whine and cry about Jesus not being there. They were told to go. Friends, my mom, when she used to tell me no, she'd say, boy, I, 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 you better, I said no. N-O. N, working on the O. And Jesus is telling his church to come to see, and to now go. What's the problem? We're not doing much going. We're not doing much going. The Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say for people to just show up at the church house, the, the world just to show up at the church house. The Bible compels us and tells us to go and get them. We can, can I tell you something this morning? There's something that's been going on in the church for centuries that pains my heart. You cannot show me anywhere in Scripture, Brother Gabe, where it says that I'm supposed to sit here and pray, that, and pray to the north and pray to the south and pray to the east and to the west that God bring them in. Is it in the Bible? Is it anywhere in the Bible? Somebody please help me. I read in my Bible that I'm to go to the east I'm to go to the west, I'm to go to the north, and I'm to go to the south, and I'm to bring them. It's like that saying, I'm waiting for my ship to come in. Honey, it ain't coming. You better go to it. Get to swimming. And we can sit here and pray that God fill this church. We can sit here and pray that God save Joey, and that God save little Susie, and that God minister to so-and-so, my next-door neighbor. But if you don't get up and go to their house, take them a loaf of bread, take them a cup of coffee, if you don't go and just begin to minister to them, who's going to tell them if you don't? So Jesus, the angel says to these women, Come, see. Now go. Now go. Where are we going? Where are we going? We're going to where God's called you to go. Listen. Look at Acts 1.8. It's on there. I just know the scriptures, but I'm going to jump to this one. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my what? witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. <clears throat> when we go, where are we going? If I go to Walmart, I'm going to be a witness. I'm not going to witness, I'm going to be a witness. See, I think that's where we get, the, we get so much hypocritical things going on in the church because people catch church people not being a witness everywhere they go. We can say, hey, Saturday morning we're going to do a door-to-door -door, uh, marathon and we're going to knock on people's doors and we're going to go and witness to them and they're going to shut the door in our face because they don't, tra people have abused tracks, people have abused all that. But when they catch you, not in church, but when they catch you, just being a witness because you're called to walk, walk in a manner according to your calling. You're living it out every single day. And so whenever I'm not here on Sunday mornings preaching, if I act any different outside of these walls of this church, I have now become a poor witness. The Bible says, whatever you find your hands doing, do it as if you're doing it unto the Lord. Amen? Because I have had the Holy Spirit that dwells within me, 
didn't come on me just so I can say I got the Holy Ghost. It has come on me to give me power to be a witness in Leesville, in Rose Pine, in DeRitter, in Anacoco, in Vernon Parish, in Louisiana, in the United States, in the whole world. We're taking a trip to Nicaragua in June. Thank you for those that came out this morning and helped us with the pancake breakfast. But I'm going to tell you something. For those of us going to Nicaragua, if we don't know how to be a witness here, how in the world are we going to be a witness there? Or if we go over there and we act more like a witness over there and then we come back and, and neglect our duty, our responsibilities here in America, that's, that's, that's just in vain. We're called to be, to go and be a witness. Go where? Where do you go? Go to people. And then that lastly, number five, after you go, what do you do? Because see, there's a lot of people going, but this next point is really vital. The, next, the last point is tell. You come, see, now go and tell. We're telling a lot of stuff. I, man, I can't believe Pastor wore a bow tie this morning. What are we telling? We, we've got prayer ministries and churches today that's just turned into gossip rings. Do you know that that pastor's kid was doing this or that? Oh, I get so fired up when people start talking about my kids. We go and tell, but what are we telling? What are we telling? The women were supposed to tell the disciples of the resurrection. As someone has said, Christianity is one beggar telling another where to find bread. There was once a demon-possessed man who was healed. He wanted to travel with Jesus. Instead, he was told to go home and tell the great things the Lord had done for him. Look at Mark five nineteen. Is that there? Hey. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. This guy wanted to travel with Jesus. He'd been delivered. He'd been set free. Still today, the anointing breaks and destroys the yoke of bondage. And if you are a true witness, you're carrying the anointing of God. Friends, we have a job to do. We have a job to do. How many of you think it was awesome to see all those people accept Christ this last week? Amen? As awesome as that was, and I was, I was so excited, I'm super excited about it. I remember one time pastoring in Cincinnati where a lady called me. And she said, Pastor, we just led a lady to the Lord in our cell group. She wants to know if, we can, if she can be baptized tonight. I said, Sister... Fill up that bathtub and dunk that girl right there. But past, can I, you don't have to butt pastor nothing. If you were in the cast, uh, Brother Pastor Dwayne asked you how many of you were ministers. And you did, hardly anybody raised their hand that first Friday night, right? But we all are ministers of the gospel. You don't have to have ordained in front of your name, doctor, PhD, whatever. You don't have to have anything in front of your name to baptize somebody. And so, as awesome as 161 people getting saved was to me, I dare one of you to call me and say, Pastor, I just led somebody to the Lord one-on-one, -on -one, personally. I dare you to do that. Man, I'll be the most excited person you've ever met because I still get excited when people accept Jesus. It bothers me when the church is quiet when people get saved because literally somebody's lives was just snatched out of the pit of hell. Literally. And brought us the way. People always, and, and funerals today drive me nuts. We preach everybody to heaven. I'm sorry, not everybody that dies is going to heaven. Only if they had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Accepted Him as Lord and Savior. John 3, 3. Unless you become born again, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have a job to do. It's our job to tell others what great things the Lord has done. Look at Psalms 107, verse 2. I'm getting ready to close this. 
Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. How many of you have been redeemed? Say so. What did he redeem you from? All this trouble. Look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. There's that word go. See, we are on the G. We should be working on the O, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Guess what? We just had some people get saved this last week to this morning. We're going to baptize them. Amen. And then guess what? We want to help disciple them. That's, we don't do a growth track just to be doing a growth track. We want to disciple people. Get people plugged in. We want people to understand what they're gifting, what they've been given by God. We want people to walk in their destiny, to walk in their purpose, to accomplish the great will of God for their life. Because there's more to life than just sitting in a chair on a Sunday morning. Look at, look at Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go. How many of you are keeping count of how many times this man, Jesus has said go? Or we've seen go in the Bible. Go into all the world. Not just go where I want to go. I praise God that Leesville First Assembly supports so many missionaries. And praise God he's called each and every one of us to be one too. Right? Go, therefore, into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. I seen a service dog walk into church this morning, and I immediately thought, Lord, I wonder if all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> Look at 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, wow, this convicts me. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We pastored in New England for four years prior to coming to Louisiana. The whole, all of New England is 2% Christian. It forced me because they like to argue. They like to debate. If you've ever been in New England, you'll know this to be true. They love to debate. I had to really understand apologetics like I never had before in my life. This scripture right here really, really became etched deep into my heart. Just telling somebody that they need to get saved is a bunch of garbage. You better tell them why they need to get saved. Amen? Tell them the hope of glory. Tell them why you really believe what you believe. I love the story of the case for Christ. Here's Lee Strobel, who was an atheist, an investigative reporter, set out to prove, the, to prove Christ as fake and false. And in his investigation, he proved, it was proved wrong. And they just came out with the movie, Case for Christ, and the books are amazing. But friends, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, how are you going to tell somebody? Right? How are you going to tell somebody? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect. I want to ask you if you'd bow your heads. Our worship team's going to come. Those of you that need to get baptized, I'm going to ask you to make your way to the, out this side door. But as every head's bowed and every eye's closed... The message of Easter has been presented. The invitation of Christ is being given. He is saying, come. Come. See. Go and tell. So this morning, if you're here, and you've never have asked the Lord Jesus to come into your heart and life. You've never confessed that He is Lord. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about saying this or saying that. I'm saying I'm talking about something real and authentic, life-changing, transforming. 
If you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, or you're here and at some point in life you did and, and, and a BBS or something like that, you said a prayer or whatever, you just are not where you need to be with God. The invitation to come is before you this morning. So if you're here this morning and you hear that invitation to come, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Pastor, that's me. I hear the invitation loud and clear to come. I'm not where I need to be. If I, I know that if I died right now today, I don't know if I'd make it to heaven. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you could make it to heaven. Thank you for your hand. Is there someone else? Pastor, I need someone to pray for me. I want to receive Christ. Right, I want to ask you all, all of you to stand with me. How many of you are here this morning and you say, you know, I've been looking, I just haven't seen it, but I see it very clearly today. Now, I don't want to just see it, I want to go. I've been praying, I've been thinking that it's somebody else's job. But this morning I see it very clearly. And I want to say, God, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? And I want to go. I don't want to just go just to go. I want to go and tell. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to get some movement. Come, get out of your seat. Come to the altar. Come and see. And then don't leave until you have received from God to go and tell. Or if you're here and you say, Pastor, I've got it all figured out. I don't have to do anything. You and I need to change places. We all have a job to do, amen? So this Resurrection Sunday, I'm asking you to do something. As they begin to sing, I'm going to slip out and I'm going to go get changed to do some baptisms, but I'm asking you to do something. To respond, just as those women did. They came they saw they left and they went and told would you come and just present your life a living sacrifice to the king of kings and the lord of lords would you come and just present your life and say father here i am use me i don't know how you'll use me but god i want to be your hands i want to be your feet i want to be your mouthpiece so on the count of three i'm asking you to move one don't think about it just be obedient. Two, God, I'm coming. I'm coming. And three, I'm bringing my life to, to you, to an altar of God this morning. I'm surrendering it to be used of you. Thank you, Jesus.